Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. I'm Dr. Jay Calvert, once again with my faithful co-host, Dr. Millicent Novello. I am faithful. You are. Faithful and I'm loyal. Thank you. you. Happy to have you here. (laughs) It's going to be a very good podcast because we're going to talk about the first big plastic surgery meeting that we attended since this pandemic started. It was so nice. It was so nice. It's good. It was good. It was really good. So the aesthetic meeting is what it's called. It's the annual meeting for the Aesthetic Society, which is sort of the main big organization of aesthetic surgeons in the United States and, um, well, actually across the world because we do have international members as well. And typically we have an annual meeting every year someplace nice and everyone goes and you see your colleagues and old friends and you learn a lot of stuff and it's really great and it's a good time and everyone looks forward to it. You learn a lot. You learn a lot. Last year was COVID, so it was supposed to be in, gosh, where was it supposed to be last year? Vegas. That's right. It was supposed to be in yeah, Vegas was. last That's year right. in May. It's usually in May, and that was right when COVID hit, so it was canceled. And then this year, they opened it up for in person. They limited how many people could attend, and they had social distancing and mask requirements. But it was a great time. Yeah, it was really. It was a great meeting. I was glad that we got there from you know the Beverly Hills contingency. We were, you know, sort of in the mix with that especially we were, we were well represented beverly hills represented yeah definitely at the and i should say so even not even more importantly but equally importantly it was in miami which right. was incredibly fun and such a great place to go and visit right they don't have COVID there evidently <laughs> they don't <laughs> <laughs> which makes it very easy and some since some vaccinated brethren like us show right. up there we were totally cool it made it for a very um low-key low stress situation because the majority of the people attending the event were in the medical profession so we've all been vaccinated for months now um and then the well the city and state itself had its own mask mandates for indoors especially the hotel and the convention hall but outdoors there really was no requirements that I saw. No. Yeah. And they were vaccinating. I mean, there was a yeah. vaccination center, like literally you walked out of the convention right. center <laughs> and they had a vaccination place yeah. there. So if you were shy of a vaccine, you could walk over there and just go get it. Get you one. Know, it was all set. So, but the meeting was great. Uh, the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, which is the, I guess, is it becoming the Aesthetic Society? It is. Yeah. The old name was American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, ASAPs. And then that's kind of a mouthful. So they've now shortened it to just the aesthetic society. So that's, that's the deal now. That's the deal. Well, that's good. I didn't, I wasn't there for the business meeting for that formal (laughs) resolution passing, but uh, that's okay. We did make it to our business meeting. You You dragged me to the business meeting. I was like, I want to go to lunch. (laughs) You "You have to go to the meetings member. Yeah. And you're a member. (sighs) That's the business meeting. And I'm glad I went. I voted I and yeah. I participated and I'm really glad I went. I think I seconded the so, uh, motion. So thank you for, for making me go to the the members meeting. What was your biggest take home? What what did you really come out of there saying, wow, that's great. I'm totally going to do that in my practice. You know, what was interesting about this particular meeting this time around is that for the first time, they had a whole mini symposium on aesthetic breast reconstruction. So historically, Mm. breast reconstruction has fallen under the reconstruction umbrella of plastic surgery. And that typically occurs at the ASPS meeting, which is a more academic, reconstructive oriented meeting. And that's where people talk about breast reconstruction. But this year, they introduced an aesthetic breast reconstruction course symposium it was half a morning or half a day long and they talked about the fact that breast reconstruction is very much aesthetic and you can't ignore that fact about it and so i that's what i really enjoyed going to because i do so much of that and learning different techniques on how to make a breast reconstruction as aesthetically pleasing as possible it's not just throwing some implants in there and saying oh you have breast mounds like it's really about making it look like they never really even had a, a mastectomy yeah i think that was a really great point because you know as you said the breast reconstruction has sort of always been relegated to the uh asps meeting the you know plastic surgery the meeting yeah which is uh typically in the fall 
uh, which I think is coming up soon. Yeah. Yeah. Where's that going to be? Atlanta. Hotlanta. <laughs> we got to go to that. We should totally we go. go. <laughs> I love Atlanta. I am a huge Buckhead fan. Um, so, yeah, I think that bringing that in was great. I thought it was great that they brought in the, uh, they did a lot of like the BII stuff, you know, breast yes. implant illness. I thought that was an in- interesting morning. Yeah, so that is a newer topic on the horizon, breast implant illness and a spectrum of diseases or symptoms that patients who have breast implants can experience. And it's a very controversial topic because we don't have a lot of scientific evidence on it. And so this was a good way to sort of open up that discussion amongst plastic surgeons about what evidence we do have for it. I thought it was great. I thought, you know, that they they really are trying to drill down and get the evidence. And it looks like, you know, more data is needed. But, you know, people are definitely going to continue getting explants. I mean, obviously, you know, we know that textured gel implants can cause, you know, very weird uh, tumor in very, very small numbers of people. So why can't breast implants cause somebody to feel sick from them? You know, that that's also the, the big question. Right. So they're really trying to drill down and get the data on that. For most people, breast implants are totally benign and fine. For most people. 99.99. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's a very small number of people that have these issues, but they right. do have them, and, and they're impossible to ignore. So I think that was very valuable that a, uh, that the Aesthetic Society yes. has chosen to you know make that part of the, right. the curriculum for plastic surgeons to learn it as, a, as a really important core part of the specialty. Um, I got to say... My favorite part of the whole meeting, though, was the uh, the plastic surgery fellows bolt. <laughs> oh yes, yes, we got to <laughs> ring, ring your bell on that one. The oh, plastic yes. bowl, yes. So this was a competition <laughs> amongst plastic surgery aesthetic right over here, fellowships. Right. Well, you're okay, you're gonna spoil the punchline. Okay, sorry. I'm just gonna... patience. Shh. All right. Shh. <laughs> sorry. Um, and there was four um, fellowships represented, of which the rocks surgery the marina rocks fellowship was one of them the other one was out of um our fellow of course justin just incredible just Perez. incredible he was our representative um and then there were three other programs nyu nyu represented by uh stelios wilson yes and then uh there was uh the houston uh that's right the fellowship from houston which i wasn't familiar with yeah. but evidently they have like a zillion surgeons there yeah and then also it was uh the one from North Carolina, from yes. Charlotte, uh, right. which was Dr. Hunstad's uh, yes. fellow. Yeah, and so the fellows um, got up there and gave presentations. They had three assigned topics. The first one was, um, I think, what I learned, or the most important thing I learned in this fellowship. The, the biggest pearl from your pe- from, fellowship. From the residency, or yeah, from the fellowship. And then the other one was the interesting case that they were involved in or did themselves. And then the third one was... The best practice meant. This was why, oh, this is why yeah, NYU that's took, why that guy got NYU took a five-minute yeah. major on this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah there they was practice management pearl. Right, so not the necessarily the clinical, scientific, surgical aspect, but the business management technique of the practice. Right, so there Stelios three things. Took, a, took a big hit yeah, there because he, he, he I, I think he just misinterpreted the question, right. but still he didn't answer the question. He showed yeah. that he thought that adding liposuction and fat grafting to basically any body procedure was, was very helpful, but it wasn't practice that's management. That's not a practice, that's a clinical pearl. No, that pearl. was a clinical pearl, yeah. and so they, they penalized him fairly <laughs> heavily for that. and uh, Which allowed Team Beverly Hills to sneak ahead oh, yeah. and win that cup. It was very big. Literally a plastic bowl. It's called the plastic bowl <laughs> because the prize was... <laughs> A plastic bowl. A plastic bowl. And there it held is. Held in place by I, I'm, um, gum? I think it's Glue? putty or gum. Elmer's? Not sure. I think Bill Adams <laughs> may have chewed this gum and stuck it on there, and then that's it. But this thing weighs a lot. It does. It's I don't know where they got this thing from, but it's definitely, it was heavy in the suitcase. I had to bring it back. Yeah. Because there you have it, the plastic bowl. Just incredible, and Dr. Calvert for the win on that one. And they did, they did weigh in the attending's input. Yeah. That was part of, oh, uh, you know, I had that. to, yeah, I had to, you know, I had to represent if we were going to win that thing. Well, you represented well. It was and good. You took it I home. I was very happy. Very proud of that. Um, I was also on the, uh, that rhinoplasty panel, which I thought was good too. Did, you, you didn't see that though. That was when you were doing a breast I was thing. doing the breast. I did mostly breast stuff. I did breast and I did some um, 
genital aesthetic genital surgery um, I know I walked in at the wrong time. Yeah, you, that, uh, like, oh, that, what, what am I looking at? I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> I just thought it was rough, but, yeah. but it, it was very helpful. Actually, I was glad I saw it because, you know, I, as plastic surgeons, you know, our patients ask us to do everything. And I, you know, I do some number of labiaplasties every year. And so like watching experts like talk about how they think about it was really useful. It was, there was one um, doctor who was talking to her about her technique for actually doing vagina plasties, tightening up the actual vagina itself with internal sutures. I have not done that. I've never no, ventured that's... into that territory. Um, so it was really interesting seeing how she was doing it. And she does a lot of it. She's, I mean, when you think about it, if plastic surgeons aren't doing it, there's very few gynecologists that are doing it. So there's sort of well, this Was she void. doing an AP repair? Um, no, she was literally just going in there and, and de-epithelializing or removing a, a portion of the mucosa of the vagina and then suturing it back together yeah. to make it tighter. I think she was doing some perineal repairs as well, but what I mainly saw was the intravaginal ones. Yeah, that, that's not the nose. That is so a long be, way <laughs> from not, the nose. That's not the, the mid face. It's a different vestibule. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not not happening. I don't mind doing the labiaplasties and like clitoral hood reductions and things like that. I do a fair number of those, and and I like doing them. I think they're really, it's a very satisfying, rewarding surgery. You know, for the patients and for me, it's very artistic. I think it, it's a cool operation, and doing it where you don't have problems. I think is actually challenging. It is. There is definitely a learning curve to those. So sitting there with the experts and listening to their techniques and pearls and things they've learned over time is, is really helpful. Yeah, it was good. Um, the rhinoplasty panel is good. You, you probably have seen most of it. It was the this new discussion that's come up over the last few years of, you know, whether preservation rhinoplasty or structural rhinoplasty are advantageous. And sort of the take home message was, well, you should know both. You know, it's like not you can't make every operation with some certain technique. And I, 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 I'm just gonna like not go off on this because it gets me, like I think you can see the flames starting to well up in my eyes and smoke coming out of my ears. The, the truth is, is that when people try to sell techniques as a way to, to say that their operation's superior or whatever, it does make flames come out of my eyes and smoke come out of my ears because it's not true I, the reality is is the results should be what get people in the door that's be people should come for the results i want that result you seem like you get a lot of those good results i'm gonna have you do my rhinoplasty right not how oh, you, you get use there. some yeah. you use some special saw or you know evidently you know you have a a special cucumber water that you drink before you operate <laughs> maybe i should have you do my rhinoplasty like well do you like the results because that's what matters people right not how you got there necessarily no right you know, oh you drove here in a bentley so i should have you do my rhinoplasty <laughs> no you should look at the before and after photos and you should decide if you like those before and after photos and that's how you pick a surgeon because that's what you're going to get Agreed. But nevertheless, it'll be a topic. I'm sure there will be another panel next meeting about preservation rhinoplasty. I can predict it. I'm pretty sure it'll be there. So you'll have another chance to say your piece. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I think preservation's cool. I'm totally into it. I think it's awesome. I, 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 I'm like a technique meister. I collect techniques. I love picking up new techniques. And I think the preservation stuff is slick and cool. It doesn't mean that I'm going to do it on every single patient. Like, I can't do preservation rhinoplasty on secondary patients who've had osteotomies and septoplasties. Like, that, that's like not even like on, a, well, on the discussion table for me. Yeah, nothing to preserve. There. No, it's like over. <laughs> like, you know, they need like a total overhaul. So, like, people are like, oh, you should try preservation. I was like, dude, like 60% of my patients are, are destroyed by somebody else and I need to fix them. It's not going to be something that comes up on every single case. And then on my primaries, I just want to get a certain result. If they're great for preservation, I'll do it. But I can tell you I've done six of them or so, and it's like I do a yeah. lot of rhinoplasty. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, you do the math. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I've done six. It's not like I got to, like, hang my whole hat on, like, well, I do preservation rhinoplasty, so I'm better. Like, no, it's like look at the results. It's about the results. And I mean, if there were a way that 
like what would be great is to have people have a like a scoring system like here's a primary rhinoplasty and the and the degree of difficulty on this one judged by the experts or the system that says this is a degree of difficulty of a seven because it has a dorsal hump and it has ailer malposition and it has a hanging columella and it has a previous you know and a septal deviation and it's a high septal deviation and the nasal bones are asymmetric and then there's a low radix and it needs a graft so all those things go into it. And now this primary rhinoplasty is a seven. And Dr. Calvert did it, and here's the result. You go, wow, on a, on a primary rhinoplasty for the diff degree of difficulty of seven out of 10, that's a great result. And then here's the, you know a one or a two. And, and then people could actually start to look at photos in a way that would be constructive and helpful for them making decisions. Instead of saying like, I do scoreless rhinoplasty. You know, like that doesn't help anybody. You know, there's like 42 practices in this country that are advertising scarless rhinoplasty, which is like, I do endonasal rhinoplasty. Well, I do endonasal rhinoplasty. Should I, should I advertise I do scarless rhinoplasty? No, it's all about results. And that's why this preservation versus structural discussion for me is like boring. It's like, great, congratulations. Like, I think it's cool too, but I'm not gonna hang my hat on it that that's how you have to do rhinoplasty to get great results. Okay, I'll get well, off the Well, I'm glad you now. decided you weren't going to get wrapped up I wasn't going to get into that. it, so <laughs> I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up now and, <laughs> you know, actually, Sean, cut that whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sean, Sean has just a bitch of a job editing these things. I really feel for him. He, Sorry, Sean. He just listens to him and goes like, oh, here he goes again. <laughs> because he has to listen to all these. You he know that. Have to as, listen to as the podcast editor, your job is to listen to the whole thing and decide what stays, what goes, and how it should sound, but... I, we have an, an incredible producer uh, named Sean Gosser, who is really just, he's the best there is really in, in podcasting. I mean, he's been doing it longer than anybody and podcasts are truly in their infancy. And so that's why, you know, I think it's good that we've been doing this for quite some time so people can get something out of it. And I think we're able to distill things down about like a meeting or something like that. Well, we had wanted to, take our podcast mobile and do a podcast in I Miami. Know, we blew that it. was what we really <laughs> wanted to do. But there just there ended up not being time. But the whole thought was we'd kind of go on the road with it and talk to people in Miami and get their impression on plastic surgery because obviously plastic surgery and aesthetics in Miami are different than Beverly Hills or in Houston totally or in New York. Different. So it was a cool concept. We just never had the time to actually do it. But I will say the one thing I noticed amongst the plastic surgeons who are from Miami, who spoke at the conference, and then just also being in Miami and going out and about, um, there's a big emphasis on butts. Butts are huge in Miami, like literally and figuratively, <laughs> butts like are huge. Butts. <laughs> but, I mean, just we were staying, you and know, big. In they want them big, 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 and they just let them hang out. You know, you're yeah, there's going like down pants the street, optional. like like literally pants optional. It is. I mean, they it's, wear like two strings across their back and then like a post-it note, and that's like their bikini. Yeah, but they, they're walking down the street. Like <laughs> exactly. it's one thing on the beach. Like sure, fine, you're on the beach. Like let it yeah, all hang like, out. But this is on IHOP. the street. They're going to the restaurants, and they're in their <laughs> you know so thong true. bikini with like a piece of mesh covering it them. It is. It's like, or they wow. have these shorts which are covering like half their butt, which I think is amazing, and I love it. And I just I kept like swiveling my head around and being like, oh look at that one, and oh look at that one. Yeah, it's true. It's kind of like a like a the, like the. Seven Great Wonders of the World. Kind I know. Of thing. I was so <laughs> I was happy like, wow. just to like check out the scenery in Miami and all the butts that were hanging out. Yeah, they they are they are totally pants optional. They they could give a crap, and they literally walk around like like they're that's kind of the that's style. That's the deal. Yeah, hanging Although, all out. It's the all one good. thing I did notice, which I thought was interesting, was that by the end of my stay there, I it. I didn't even notice it anymore. I, know. I was like, uh, like <laughs> so when true. I first got there, I was like, ooh, butts. And then by the end of my like my stay, I was like, yeah, yeah. seen one already. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I've seen a big one that like that. Though. You know, so yeah. there is something I'm I'm realizing now to preserving the mystery. And because when you just let it all hang out there all the time, like it's not that exciting to see it anymore. No, it's true, and and I I get I get that for sure. But you know, it, it is uh, it, it's interesting that you know the 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 different parts of the country truly have a whole different emphasis on what is the body aesthetic. Yes. You know, facial aesthetics are a whole nother animal, but the body aesthetic of like Los Angeles versus Miami are two, if you took yeah. 20, 20 people from the Santa Monica Pier versus 20 people that were on that boardwalk in South Beach, 
you know, at Miami Beach and, and compare them. They, they'd look totally different. They'd be totally different. And even just even like New York, a, a friend of mine that I saw a couple of days ago, she's living in New York. She lived in New York for many years and she wants to have her breast implants downsized because she said she just, they feel like they're too big, especially in New York, walking around with breast implants. And hers are... In my, in my mind, fairly conservative already. And to her, they're just, they're way too big. She needs to have them like half the size because that's the New York aesthetic. Yeah, totally. And if she came to see a plastic surgeon here, they'd be like, oh, you want to upsize those? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. 600s will be good for you, man. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's just every part of the country, every part of the world is different, which I think is great. Yeah. And that's why, again, a meeting like the Aesthetic Society was great because we had those Miami plastic surgeons. They're talking right. about butt. The yep. butt panel was amazing. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was great because, I mean, there's so many ways to, to, yeah. to make butts bigger and prettier and, and what the aesthetic is they're too like th th there's they're too diverse to say like oh this guy does this i mean everybody's got a different idea of what right. what it should look like right you know and i think that's where you have to kind of really talk to your patient and hone in on what they're looking for because you know not everybody just wants you know these gargantuan butts but there are some guys that if you go there like that's what you're getting that's what you're gonna get and because so look at the instagram do. and yeah. figure it out you know yeah. Um, when I do butt augmentations with fat, it's usually, you know, four or 500 cc's at, at the high end. And, and sometimes it's a lot less than that, but mm. you know, some people really want a lot. They want, they want them humongous. So it's all about the look. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. That was a good part of it. Um, I do have to say some of the food was. Yes. Spectacular. The food, the, oh, the oh night, God. the, the nightlife in Miami is great. I'm such a lizard i love warm weather and warm nights especially so if i can go out and it's a nice warm night and i don't have to wear a sweater yeah. like count me in i i love any place like that yeah it was really cool but the, the food was excellent the nightlife was great the meeting was wonderful i learned a lot so two very we'll positive back. thumbs up <laughs> we'll go, we'll go next wait. year next year is in uh san diego ah san diego yep. that will be a good one yeah, I mean, that's it's close by. It's easy to get there. Yeah, it's kind of like, meh. <laughs> yeah, we'll I could go. go to San Diego any weekend. But I am excited for the meeting. So, But there, are, there are some great restaurants down that gas lamp district, oh, yeah. too. And the meeting will be great. So, cool. And, uh, yeah, next year I will not be the president of the Rhinoplasty Society. So I will have an easy time with that. I think I just have to do the, uh, for the Rhinoplasty Society, I will just be the uh, chair of the nominating committee. Hmm which makes makes that a lot simpler. Nice. This year was very busy. So, well, uh, anything else about the aesthetic meeting? Nope. Just really glad we went. Had a great time. Looking forward to the next one. Very good. Well, in that case, this is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210.